What's the deal? It's the real, and welcome to the What's Your Perspective podcast, an open-ended podcast that welcomes all perspectives. So, I feel like this week has been very, very jam-packed, but very, very jam-packed regarding like music and sports, entertainment, not so much. But of course, y'all know I'm going to get into it all and share my unique perspective, of course. So, I'm going to get right into it. I'm going to start with music. I'm going to talk about the albums that dropped this week, less so of like the singles. Like I know uh, Lil Baby dropped a single, but it was like two two songs on the single, and which I did listen to. They were cool. Uh, Finesse Two Times dropped, um, and a few other people dropped too. But um, I'm going to review like Full Bodies of Work, so I'm going to get into the albums that dropped this week. So Partisan Fontaine dropped, No Guidance dropped. Baj dropped and Nicki Minaj drops her deluxe. So I'm gonna get straight into it. So, of course, Partisan Fontaine dropped the controversial sex tape. Uh, it has eight songs on it and it does not include the person. Right. So, um, I just wanna start off with some news from the album. So he claims on See the Thing is podcast that um, Megan's this song, Cobra, uh, hurt. And it kind of like ripped a scab off of what he was already healing from, which was their relationship and the whole entire situation. Um, so honestly, I, I did look at the dates cause I just had to think about it. And I'm like, it just seems like he instantly dropped the person, which was like a response to Megan Thee Stallion's like this or whatever he felt like was aimed at him at the time um yeah so she dropped that song so Megan Thee Stallion dropped Cobra on November 3rd and Partisan Fontaine dropped The Person on uh November 17th which is literally exactly 14 days it's, it's uh, two weeks after uh he heard the song which in the music industry i feel like he did pump it out really fast because you have to get things like approved i'm not sure i didn't double check and see whether partisan fontaine is an independent artist or not but still um i mean he was hard enough to drop it so whatever um i love party personally and i've been listening listening to him since underrated drop so that's like 20 that's like 2019 i didn't like the album before that but that's another conversation i love party i love party sound i've been bumping him since high since high school um and yeah but i just feel like the rollout of this album a uh, sex tape is kind of bizarre um and i'm just saying that because it coincidentally or coincidentally um dropped after you know the cobra drop and that entire like situation that entire controversy and then he went on a press run so like i mentioned before he got he he's getting on these multiple platforms which is what you're supposed to do when you're supposed to go on press runs when you're dropping an album but i don't know it just seems like he was trying to capitalize off of the entire megan the Stallion controversy so i don't know that's just my perspective but yeah i i don't i don't know and i also feel like and my rationale behind this is backed up by the music it's backed up by the facts baby so yeah um i just feel like he was also throwing dags on this album so on the song my party he said and i quote i hate when bitches get their body done and start a fitness page like sir and he claimed in the person that she got lipo and tried to act like she just was working out which i just i don't know i don't appreciate that but look look now nah, i'm i'm not messy i'm just observant so i like to keep it about the music so honestly i give this album a solid 7.5 out of 10 and my favorite song is that's cute um i feel like this album was a really <laughs> ironically it was a really healthy mix of like toxic healing which is something that he mentioned constantly throughout this entire press run he's having right now or was having um in the past few weeks he did just drop the album two days ago um so yeah but when he said alfredo in mistakes is the only thing hoes know how to make oh my god it gagged me it gagged me i was cracking up like sir but but partisan fine saying 
in my opinion, is known to have bars like that. Like, he throws dags. It, I don't feel like that was directed towards Megan. I do feel like the other bar was. But this bar just gagged me. I like this album. But, um, oops. But, um, I do feel like the majority of the album was honestly just talking about how he was really really unlucky when it comes to love and i feel like that's a lot of what this generation has experienced with and i think that's really really unfortunate i think that's really really sad but it's the reality and at least throughout his entire like love life experience and all of his relationships he's been able to come out with his beautiful daughter so i feel like that's that's nice like that's at least he has something to look forward to like coming out of all of these negative situations but um he also said like heartbreak has been his story and he mentioned that in a few songs which once again i feel like is really unfortunate but once again i also feel like on the other hand it put the battery in his back for the toxic portion of the album which once again was mixed really perfectly and Although, once again, like referring to his daughter and the whole Megan situation, I think this kind of drove him. I'm not sure if he truly did make this album, like, and curated it and made all these songs, like, cater to his experiences with Megan specifically. But I do think that, I do think, yeah, my perspective is just that he made music based off of his experiences. And she is one of his experiences, so I don't know. I, I like the album and I like to keep it about the music so I do give it a 7 out of 10 and my favorite song is That's Cute. Tap in the party if y'all haven't already because I really like Party Sin Fontaine. So yeah. But moving on from that, next up the album that dropped is from a group called No Guidance. The album is called Unplugged. It's an EP with four songs on it and I give it a 9 out of 10 real high rating for me real high my favorite song is is it a crime honestly i came across this boy group this boy group i came across um this r b group i'm on apple music uh they're a british or like a uk r b group and i love them like i really feel like they bring back that well 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 deserves early 2000s 90s r&b sound and i love that i feel like their voices are so so pure i haven't been able to find like uh separate songs by them or like separate bodies of work by them is for them in this uh, r&b group but it looks like according to like apple music and youtube that they've been dropping music this entire year and it looks like they just started dropping music together this entire year so throughout the entire 2023 um because that's all i can personally find but i really really hope they keep dropping like i'm excited uh to watch their group grow and i really feel like this their sound is well needed especially today um because i kind of feel like we lose sight of like the r&b music and i think most of us only listen to like the Brent Fiazes and the Scissors. i think we overlook like the alex isley's and the nia sultans like I don't know. I think we need a lot more mainstream R&B artists. And I think that they're going to break the ice on this. And also, something that stuck out to me was the fact that Victoria Monet wrote for them. And they wrote my favorite song. She wrote my favorite song or took a part in writing it. Uh, she took a part in writing it. Is it a crime? So go listen to that. It's an amazing song. I love it. Love it. I love them. I can't wait to see them grow. But uh, moving on to Baz, um, his album is titled We Only Talk About Real Shit When We're Fucked Up. And I give it a solid 8 out of 10. My favorite song is Passport Bros or Carol Toon. <sighs> I just really have to take a breath from that. Baz dropped an album that was so him. So him, so him. Um, this album just really, really hit different for me. It just took me back to like the 2016, 2014 vibes that I have been missing so much. I did like the last album he dropped with like Boca Raton and stuff on it. And I was in like 2019 or 2020, I believe. But I really, I like this album. I feel like 
we needed the raw and real sh it kind of really heavily reminded me of call and um like the whole album the, i bad with album titles but the album with like bio mentality on it um there we go whatever um i i really like this i like this album and i appreciate whenever rappers talk about real shit. and of course a dreamville sign artist would never disappoint um but i really do appreciate that he took the time to curate this album in a time where nobody really talks about real shit anymore nobody talks about the struggle anymore nobody talks about trying to come up nobody talks about being black in america anymore like, i feel like there's spaces and nobody wants to hear rappers just talk about toting guns and killing people and booty and ass and hoes and all the time like i feel like oops i feel like this album was so so well needed so so much it was it was needed it was very necessary and i like it um and i also like the fact that boz really just he flows on every beat like i love his voice i love his voice i feel like his voice alone is what carries the majority of his music and it's a big asset like it's his signature honestly even when he sings on a beat like i really like it so yeah he flows on every beat perfectly um and i just miss this era of music when real reigns supreme like literally when real shit reigned supreme i feel like that was one of the best eras the isaiah rashar era the no name era like 2016 2014 2017 era i love vibes um and yeah of course along with that uh, j cole killed all of his features um i think he had three features on this album um and they were they were all well needed um my favorite two songs well my favorite yeah i couldn't pick like i said was password bros he's j cole is featured on that so tap into that yeah i i really think this this was this week kind of has albums that are like very well needed pieces of sound today so i love that i appreciate that and i'm happy that i get to cover it for you guys so moving on so last but not least Nicki minaj dropped a deluxe to her recent album pink friday 2 gag city deluxe she only added two songs to it which i guess was the gag because baby where's the rest come on babes like where's the rest she added two songs so now the album is 24 songs instead of 22 which is cool but the the song that she dropped with 50 was was mid honestly it was pretty mid it gives tiktok song which is i'm not hating at all it's a, it's a cool song but it's not my cup of tea it wasn't my favorite but love me enough featuring monica and keisha cole oh that song did it for me that song did it for me i love it and it's something that i also love just in general about Nicki minaj's artistry is that she's able to stay true to herself and her sound especially with her being like an older artist at this point and her kind of releasing this album in a sexy red and ice spice and glorilla type era it's like this album was more so soft like it was very feminine which is something i wasn't really able to digest when i originally listened to it like the first three times but after i listened to it throughout this week i really really it really really grew on me and it's not that i didn't like it prior to this it's just more so of I don't know i i really i and i want to kind of go back on what i said and kind of raise the rating that i gave her i think i gave her like um her, this album specifically like uh seven and a half eight out of ten but i want to give it like an 8.5 now and i feel like these two songs really really kind of forced me to revisit and i really appreciate that so yeah um i wish she could have added more songs but i really do like um love me enough and yeah um i give it a solid eight and a half out of ten which is a really high rating coming from me so yes so now moving on to my top five underrated artists of the week i'm actually going to i'm actually including one of the artists that were on or that dropped this week so 
First and foremost, I'm going to start with No Guidance, which is a UK R&B group. Um, once again, my favorite song is Is It a Crime? I just feel like they're bringing back that must-needed early 2000s, um, 90s R&B type of song. And I love that for them. I feel like their music is just so, so pure. They have angelic, absolutely angelic voices. And I love the way their voices are curated and come together to make amazing bodies of work so yeah um moving on to nilla allen she's an la artist and honestly i feel like she just runs every beat like you can give her a topic and she can rap about anything like literally anything and i also feel like she remakes classics on already classic beats so what she did um on the recent tape that she dropped was she used samples or like beats from songs and classic songs like that that she really really is that she really really likes and she's really fond of so she took some of her favorite beats and she curated an entire album and that's actually something that i scrutinized her for in the beginning when i originally heard the album because i'm like damn like does this girl need a producer because i know a few like i can point them out we can do business you know but it's it, it wasn't her intent her intent was to create a body of work that i guess it was to run on her favorite beats basically like literally it was an album full of her favorite beats and she ran it on every beat i'm gonna give her that like she could rap i just thought she wanted to produce her something but but no so now that i understand the intent you know what i mean less scrutiny but regardless um i just feel like she's a raw artist but my favorite song by her is actually on that on the recent album she dropped, and it's called Truffle Butter. So I'm moving on to see Stunna. He's a Florida artist, and my favorite song by him is Duet Stalker. Um, I just feel like he run it up. Like he makes run it up hustling music, but the Florida version. Because my hustling, my hustling and like run it up music sound different. Like I'm from Detroit. So the music is just it hit different in the South. Um, Detroit is always going to be better, but, excuse me, excuse me, but I do love, I don't know, I love that Florida accent, like, I just love that Florida accent, so, yeah, um, so next up, we're going to take it back up north, next up on the list is going to be CCBKE, she's a, she's a Chicago artist, and I just feel like, honestly, Looking at her catalog and looking at her, she's honestly just a Chicago Cardi B. Like, just being 100% honest, her flow is crazy. She surfs every beat. Like, she's able to ride every way, and it's tough. Like, the bodies of work she comes out with are tough, and they're all different. Like, from her features to her videos, like, everything looks, it looks different, but it looks her. You know what I'm saying? So... I, I really like that, and, and I feel like it's really, really original. And I actually have a lot of favorite songs by her, like Let Me Bang, Trick, um, yeah. Um, but yeah, so my favorite song by her as on this list is going to be Out West. Um, and last but not least is Bay Vanilla, Vanilla Visas, okay? Uh, she's a Detroit artist, and I just feel like she gives sexy swiper. Like, she makes hustle music as well, but she makes it for the girls, and that's something I appreciate. Like, her music just makes me feel myself. Like, her music makes me feel myself, but she, it also motivates me to run up a bag. So, like, it's like, I don't know, like, once it's like sexy swiper music, sexy hustling, sexy hustling music. Like I'd like that, and I also love her voice. But my favorite song by her right now is gonna be Bulletproof. Okay, so those are my top five underrated artists, and that is my perspective on music this week. Okay, so next up, I am going to share my perspective on entertainment this week. I'm going to get into Rap Shit Season Two, Episode Seven. Raising Canaan episode three, season three, episode three. Um, baddies, I don't know what episode this is, I don't even think they label them. And then I'm gonna get into two must see Christmas movies, okay? And they have black sandals. Get into it. So, um, I just want to start with some news, honestly. I saw Coco Jones dressed up in like a Tiana, uh, 
a Seattle costume from Princess and the Frog. And I, I, my heart melted. Like, my heart literally melted. Like, I love that. I hope that she actually takes the role on. Because that would be so nice to see. I really wanted Princess and the Frog to have, um, like, a two. Because I deserve, I feel like her storyline and everybody in their storyline deserved a bit more depth. So yeah, I hope that she they, they that they actually make it a live movie because I don't want to go see a play. I don't think I want to see it in any other like entertaining format. I would much rather just see it a real time a real time movie. Um, yeah, I hope they make that happen. I hope she wasn't just dressed up because she was dressed up. She was singing, and if it was fake. Gaslighting. Gaslighting at its finest. Moving on to TV. <laughs> so, uh, Rap Shit Season 2, Episode 7 just came out recently. And I love the way this episode started. It was hilarious. Absolutely hilarious. They started off um, the episode with uh, Mia and Shauna debuting their new song. And also, they were on live. So, they were on live debuting their new song. And then they... Um, Further down the line, they were answering questions within the um, the live, and they also asked their fans to send them some beats. The beats were trash, but at least they sent them, you know? Um, I also think Maurice is lame and weird for attempting to apologize to Shauna now. I just already feel like he kind of proved himself to be really deceitful and really sneaky. I just don't think there's anything that's going to be able to help his case. Excuse me, at this point, like, I just think they need to see it through. They need to lay low and try not to get a case. Try not to catch a case, which is something he's already in the midst of getting. What he said, I think he was going to get, like, 15 months in jail or prison. Something like that. But I just hope they get it together. I just think they need to chill out. I, I don't want to see them together. I just, I just want to know who's going to go to jail because at the end of the day, if it's, if it's not both of them, it's going to be one of them. And jail for either of them is going to ruin their lives. Like, absolutely ruin their lives. It don't matter if it's Maurice or Shauna. Especially Shauna, if, it, if she ends up going to jail, that's just going to kill everything for her. Like, all of her opportunities, all of her everything, her family already don't really like her, already don't really respect her. So, yeah, they haven't really gotten into the way Maurice's life looks in totality. So, yeah, I'm not really sure, but I know for both of them, it's a kill. It's a kill, because I, I know Maurice is smart. I don't know nothing else, but I know Maurice is smart. So that's a, def a definite kill for both of them if they go to jail. But yeah, in this episode, also, Mia finally gets time after being on tour uh, with Lord AK and, uh, what's her name, Raina? Um, finally gets to talk to her daughter and she finally gets to ask her daughter about Lamont which is her uh, her father's child finally gets to ask her father's child or her father's child. Mia finally gets to ask Lamont about um, her little his little friend actually um, and Lamont's which is her which is Mia's baby daddy um Lamont's little friend is actually his daughter's only friend's mama. I just feel like he could have picked somebody else. So I agree with Mia, but she needs to not be pressed. Because, girl, I thought she was over him. I thought she didn't want to deal with him. What happened to that? Um. Also, Chastity finally seems like she's going to take managing these girls seriously. Like, she she honestly seems like she's going to step up and manage them, like, full time after they kind of, like, pressed her slightly, you know? Um, yeah, it, it was a slight press, not too much. But she mentioned in the episode that she was going to talk to, like, her a &R friend at this event. And she actually got the opportunity to, but she ended up having sex with the girl anyway. So I'm like, what was your point? I, I just hope that that Chastity doesn't ruin her only chance to actually come through for Mia and Shauna. Yeah, I just, I, I hope they both stand on business and I hope the sex doesn't get in the way. 
which it always seems to. Anyways, so yeah. Um, yeah. But something I do want to see from rap shit moving forward is I want to see Shauna leave Maurice alone in every single capacity. I want her to go back to Laura AK. She needs to take her ass to the hospital to see if he if he's burnt to a crisp or not. Okay. Go check on she needs to check on her real man. Okay. Um Mia and Lamont just needs to stop. Oops. Sorry. Mia and Lamont just needs to stop playing with each other and they just need to be together. They already have a little halfway happy family. They just, they just need to put this together. Um, also, once again, like everybody is saying, Chastity needs to lock in and be a manager. Like, she needs to lock in on the manager before she gets arrested for prostitution. Like, baby, we're giving you a way to get out of South Beach. Okay? Well, me and Shauna are giving them, are is giving Chastity a way to get out of South Beach. Why do you want to keep being a pimp? Baby, you have better things to do. Go manage them girls. So now moving on to Race and Canaan season three, episode three. I feel like this episode was really, really heavy. And I'm not saying like heavy as in like, oh, it was super deep. It was super, it was super sentimental. No, it was just super loaded with information and things happening at once. So um, yeah, this is the thick three cubes part of the storyline um so as we can see for those of you that are watching um the family dynamic is definitely gone all of this diminished I, I think there's a little bit still there and i do think that the the family dynamic with um what's his name marvin and uh, uh jubox is like starting back up i feel like they're kind of mending their relationship um, now that they're now that they're older and like Marvin is more self aware, and since Juke found her mother and she passed away, so I think that he is doing a lot better, and that's something I'm also going to talk about. Um, so yeah, especially since Marvin is actually working towards being a better person, he actually in this episode ended up helping Juke prep for her audition, which was so cute. Um, and he got this guy. I don't remember where who he is or what. He asked in the storyline, but he helped this guy Greg out of a jam. I guess he was like a drug addict or something that he owed these guys money. I don't really know. I don't remember him. I don't remember this character. And that's probably good, I guess. Just he probably just looks so far out from what he looked like in maybe like season one. Cause he did look real drugged out, like real bad. But um what I don't like is the fact that Lou never show up for jukebug's audition but it really didn't look like jukebug did really well jukebug jukebox whatever juke uh did really good in her audition although it was like 30 seconds i feel like she did well but moving on from that unique and rock are still together oh it's not cute i don't like it um and it's just super odd to me because I feel like we're all forget. Like, I've seen people say, like, oh, that's so cute. No. I've literally seen people say this is cute. And Unique still has a wife and a child that he's cheating on to be with Rock. At least Rock doesn't have a boyfriend or, or a husband or anybody else that she should be loyal to. Unique is just stepping out. For what? I'm talking about he had a mouthpiece on him. Okay, why don't he use that mouthpiece on his wife? I digress. And he's an op. I digress. Anyways, um, his uh, unique brother Ronnie is an obvious and complete psychopath. Um, and I feel like he's really, 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 really stuck in the past, and that's something that unique constantly reminds him of. But I feel like his psychotic mental is just messing him up and i feel like it's gonna mess up the story and it's gonna piss me off but he obviously still thinks that rock is an op like i mentioned in my first episode of what's your perspective rock and unique were at odds at one point because they were both big time drug dealers essentially fighting for territory so they were ops at one point and they were competitors as well 
And now they're together. Ugh. I digress. Um, he followed and stalked Unique, Rock, and Kanan. He stalked Unique and Rock because they were doing the duel this one night and he followed them. And then Kanan, he just followed him in broad day and just stood there in his face. And that was weird. <laughs> like, that was super duper weird. Like, he's a psychopath. And he's out for the wrong people. He's trying to come for family and nobody's even checking for Rock. Or checking for rock right now. Now, look, famous is childish. And he's annoying, but he didn't deserve to get smacked like that. Like, me for real. Like, Kanan is really feeling himself after that little weed he's selling. He think he big time. He feel like El Chapo. Like, or you know what? Be better yet, he feel like rock. Because this is really probably what rock felt like when she, you know, built her first team and had her first sale and all that. But Kanan ain't doing it, bit. He got his own corner boys. <laughs> he running that business up, baby. And, pro like, in the 80s, this probably was a really, really big deal. I don't even think a lot of people, I feel like a lot of white people, probably people in general, I mean, they smoking weed on the show, but I don't feel like we got to be, uh like, super big to, like, the 2000s, honestly. So, I feel like this probably was, like, my perspective is it probably was a really big deal for Kanan and just anybody that was drug dealing in general in the 80s. So, I guess Kanan is doing it big, but Famous did not deserve to get smacked. <coughs> At all. <laughs> At all. Um, but I do hope that Kanan doesn't get caught up by the FBI since the FBI is actively following his mother, Rock. So I hope he doesn't get caught up like that. And I hope he doesn't get caught up by Ronnie, by Ronnie just in his whole psychopathic episode. Like, I hope he doesn't get caught up in that. Because he don't deserve to. Can't think that did some dirt. But he didn't do anything to Ronnie. So I don't think he, he deserves that right now. But I do hope that Rock and Unique quit fooling around. I hope they become ops again. And I hope they never speak. Yeah. And then I really also wanted to see Jubas in a girl group uh, so bad. And I really do hope that this season is kind of like a vengeance season for um, Jubas. Excuse me. I hope that she gets to take advantage of every opportun opportunity she can. Because I think later in um, her like storyline, I think she gets killed for whatever reason. Um... I don't really know why, because once again, I didn't watch the Power Books. But um, I do know that Juke does die. So I hope that she gets to live it up. <laughs> live it up till she got to cut. <sighs> okay. And now for baddies. The notoriously messiest show on television. Um, I don't, like I said, I don't know what episode they on at this point, but I'm just honestly going to mirror the same things I said in episode one of What's Your Perspective? Because honestly, Baddies, once again, just needs to go back to Oxygen Baddies, the original Baddies. Um, but I do feel like this episode that Biggie did do her big one, not necessarily her big one, but I feel like she stood on her own because if somebody gives me an eviction notice, baby, I'm not going nowhere. I'm not leaving anywhere till I feel good and ready to leave. So I understand where she was coming from. And I do like the fact, I feel like low key Biggie sheds light on the truth about Zoo. Like I feel like my, like my perspective on that whole Biggie situation I really, my perspective on Biggie in general, I feel like she does spit the real, but because she talks so much, nobody cares. Like, it's very invalidated because it's like your, your speech and what you speak holds no weight because you do so much of it, no matter what context it's in. Like, she just talks so much. So, I do agree with what she said or kind of have, like, inspired about what she said regarding, um, like them trying to give ET a storyline because Krishan is gone. I I'm like that makes so much sense. Like they trying to give ET a storyline by somebody that's gonna jump because they don't have nobody to necessarily jump. But at first I thought that Anna was gonna be the one that's like that was gonna buck up and be quick to go 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 go. So I mean 
I don't know. But I do think they're giving E.T. a storyline. I think they're giving her way more life than she deserves. Because I personally didn't even know this girl before she was on the show. I don't know what she adds to the show. I don't know what she adds to the storyline besides banging with people. So I do think that... I do think that she's just itching to add to her storyline. But I am tired of seeing the fights. I do like at the end of this episode that they had their little pool party and stuff, but they just need to do more activities. I think in the original Bad Girls Club, they also only stayed with each other for a month. So this is suffices. Like, I get it. But it's like, come on. Even the confessionals are dry. Like, they're, they're about the same thing. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I don't know. They're not even doing confessionals together. Like, I don't really like that. But um, I do like... I like the confessional looks. I like Camilla's confessional look this week. And yeah, but also the last thing or one of the last things that I do want to comment on regarding this episode of Baddies. Um, I think it was 13, episode 13. But um, the fact that Biggie has snuck Scarface and at the end of the episode, Scarface basically snuck Biggie. First of all, I feel like Biggie could have Biggie threw that girl in the pool easy i don't know what's the car so long to just literally rip and throw her off of her but girl she would have been in a pool messing with me i would have been she would have <laughs> big slam dunk <laughs> big 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 dunk you mean not big dunk big jump big dive like so nah, she would have been in the pool but regardless though like i i don't know i don't think well no i not i don't know i think I don't think it was right for Biggie to mess up the money because all of them were very upset by her wasting, basically wasting their time and wasting their back because the club owner wouldn't let them in. But it's like, y'all have done this before. Y'all fought in the club last week. And then nobody sent us into Mariah or um, Smiley for fighting in the club. But I guess that's different because they were already in the club and they already made the money. So I get that. But... They could. I don't. I don't know. I don't know. I'm. Those are just my thoughts, my perspective on baddies. They need to put me on there at this point to make to give it a storyline to give it life because it's boring. It's it's pretty girl fight club. That's it. I just need a change from baddies. Maybe they need to switch the producers out. Natalie needs to step down. Some something needs to give because they they're not doing anything. But drinking Casamigos and fighting. Maybe that's why they're fighting, because they're drunk every day. Yeah, so moving on to movies. So I was able to um, like sit down and actually review um, two movies. And they're Christmas movies. Yes. I'm not really in the spirit this year, because I'm grown. But I love these movies, and I wish they would have came out when I was younger. So the first movie is going to be Candy Cane Lane. Now, I'm going to say my review first before I actually get into, like, the number. But, yeah, so Candy Cane Lane, I feel like it's a nostalgic classic that's full of spirit. And it's absolutely hilarious. Like, absolutely hilarious. Um, and I also feel like it has the potential to become a modern-day classic. It's original. I've never seen a movie like this with this specific storyline and on TV with a black Santa that wasn't a joke. You know what I'm saying? Like, it wasn't a scary movie. It wasn't a Kevin Hart movie. Like, it, this was a real family movie. And it had a Black Santa. And this is the first type of movie I've ever seen like this with a Black Santa that wasn't a cartoon. Nothing. This was great. I've, I've never, well, like I said before, I've never seen a Christmas movie like this. And I feel like it was perfectly cultured. I, I feel like it was perfectly cultivated and cultured. It was a great movie. Like, seriously, it was a great movie. So, essentially, the movie is about a middle class or upper middle class black family who's full of Christmas cheer. Um, the movie starts off a little rocky since one of the parents had recently lost their job. Um, so, essentially, those parents try to save Christmas. And by doing so, they make a few bad deals. So, their mission essentially ends up um, being saving Christmas before getting turned into an ornament forever. 
Um, along the way, they learn the true meaning of Christmas is about acceptance, love, and togetherness. Um, and to never sign contracts with human size elves. Ever. Learned that the hard way, for sure. Um, and I just want to say that Carrie Younger is an amazing writer. Like, this movie was a really, really good mix of, like, comedy, culture, and family. Like, it was very much PG, but it was really black. It was really black. And I'm not saying that those two things cannot go together because they definitely can. But I don't think you see that a lot. Like, a lot of black movies, I feel like, for the most part, are, or even so, they'll, they'll be, like, Tyler Perry movies, and they'll be about, like, depression and suicide and being poor and working your way up and being great like some type of struggle is always associated in a black family movie and it's so irritating and it's so tired it's so tired and i'm tired of seeing it so this movie was just really refreshing and it's a christmas movie like i love that it's i feel like it can definitely be a classic it's not out in like theaters yet but it is on amazon prime and that's how i watched it so, yeah, if you guys have Amazon Prime, I think y'all should go watch it. And if not, I think y'all should wait till it comes out in theaters because it is really a great, wholesome, uh, a great, wholesome. Uh, I feel like this is really a great, wholesome, wholesome family movie. Um, yeah, I really liked it. I really enjoyed it. And I actually gave it a 10 out of 10, which is crazy on the <laughs> on the MP scale, okay? <laughs> Big crazy on the MP scale. Um, it's hard for me to give stuff 10. It's like, you gotta work for that. But I do feel like, I wish I could, well, actually, I might still insert the clip of, like, my favorite part in the movie, because it was so funny. And it was the part that DC Young Fly had posted on his Instagram, but of course he couldn't post the whole thing. But he was like, man, I knew Santa was black. Like, woo-woo. I was cracking up. And especially the way it, like, came together. The directors for this movie were also equally as amazing as Carrie Younger. Um, I just really did love this movie, and I'm going to vouch for it. If I ever have kids, I'm going to show them. Yeah, great movie. Um, 10 out of 10 for Candy Cane Lane. Also, another thing, the way, the, the actors that they chose for their roles fit them perfectly. I feel like that's something that's also equally important when you're casting for any movie or anything in general you need to have the right people play the right roles so having eddie murphy as the father um uh, casting um oh my god i'm blanking on her name what's her name uh uh casting tracy ellis ross to be the father and then the kids the kids were really the icing on top line casting those three as as their children like absolutely it was a great movie it was a great movie i think everybody should go watch it um dashing through the snow um i feel like this was a really sweet movie as well it was kind of unexpected like the way the storyline came together i personally feel like was was kind of unexpected which was actually really nice it was refreshing um it wasn't as family oriented just because of the background of the characters which was fine like this movie is different from candy cane lynn so um dashing through the snow ends up being about ludicrous who is a separated father um who takes his daughter on a magical ride along that turns out to be her most adventurous christmas ever um this father who um isn't very <sighs> He isn't really fond of Christmas, and you'll, like, figure that out once you watch the movie. But he isn't really fond of Christmas for multiple reasons, um, but his daughter really is. So, I mean, you can probably imagine, like, that's really difficult to be raising a child that loves something that you hate. Um, so, I mean, it, I feel like his perspective on Christmas kind of shifts, obviously, as the movie goes, like, you know antagonist turned protagonist basically but i do also feel like this was a really really wholesome movie as well and it also includes a black family with a black santa i love that i love that i wish i had movies like these when i was growing up because i really i really feel like seeing yourself in me in the media and just in the world in general it just obviously it just makes you feel good about yourself 
and it would just be really nice to see something besides the black girl in the Polar Express, which is my favorite Christmas movie, to represent myself and my people in the world and in media and entertainment. So yeah, I really like these movies, but getting back to um, Dashing Through the Snow, um, I also think that this has the potential to be a classic. It's a nice movie that once again has a black Santa and I feel like it's very neutral. It's, it was also pretty funny just because of the actors that they cast for their roles. I kind of forgot like the comedian's name, but he's in everything and I love him. He is so funny, bro. Like he is so funny. But I think that he was, um, I feel like he was the icing on top for me personally because it was funny like a little comedic relief during the holidays doesn't hurt anybody so yeah i really like this movie and i think that everybody should go watch it so um and i feel like Ludacris also did his thing i think it was a really different role especially because of the job title that he had um because it kind of drove the whole storyline essentially you just gotta go watch it this is something these two movies are something i don't want to spoil so I'm not going to get into it. But I do feel like that Ludacris's role kind of supported the entire storyline because of the job that he had and pushed things farther. Like, that Santa was a He was interesting. But it was a great movie. A great storyline. So I do give Dashing Through the Snow an 8 out of 10. I know it's not a 10 out of 10, but this is still a pretty high rating to me. And it still has the potential to be a classic. So I feel like this was great. Great material, great writers, great cast. The directing was good, too. So, yeah, it out of 10 for Dash into the Snow. So that is all I have for entertainment this week. So last but not least, let's get into sports this week. So as we all know, there has been a lot going on regarding sports from Draymond Green suspension to the NFL playoffs to matchups, to generational matchups between LeBron and Wimby. Like, there's been a lot going on. A lot going on this week in the world of sports. But I'm here to share my perspective on it. So, I just want to start with some news. Now, look. I love my city. I love my city. But, baby, the Pistons need help. They, they need help. And they went on the run this season, but they went on the wrong type of run. So, um, I think at this point they have broken the franchise breaker. I made this when they didn't quite break it yet but I'm pretty sure at this point they they broke it so they almost or have broke a franchise record of the most losses in history literally in franchise history um their current record is 224 on track <laughs> they're on track to have a record of 7 and 75 throughout this entire season which is the lowest percentage which is the lowest season win percentage by any team in North American pro sports history, like outside the NFL. I think it's specifically like outside the Lions or outside the Browns. I mean, not the Browns, um, the Bears. I forgot which one. But regardless, I think that's insane. That's insane. And what's even more insane to me is that they currently have the same amount of losses as Draymond Green has suspensions. Which leads me into what everyone's been talking about lately and this week specifically is Draymond Green. He's a power forward for the Golden State Warriors and he's currently indefinitely getting suspended for the rest of the season. This isn't controversial, but I feel like it's really good hearted and it was out of having a good heart. Um, I really did try to stick up for him. But then I was sent uh, this video that's literally full of Draymond Green violating players throughout his 11 year career. All right, say no Get more. off me, bro. Bet. Why he step on Sabonis' chest like that, bro? He used and my boy as a stepping stool. My honest perspective, since this has been happening for 11 years and I never saw any press about it or anything about it, is like my perspective is everyone just kept quiet because he's a championship winner. And. He's a, you know, a pretty good big man because he's hiding his way. Just, you know, all around, like, cool guy, right? So, once again, I never really heard any controversy about it, but let's just put this into perspective. Draymond Green averages 8.7 points per game. 
then that's almost as bad as Isaiah Livers on the Pistons, who averages 6.4 points per game. Like, that's his career average. So Draymond's stats, and this is coming from my personal perspective, Draymond's stats aren't as high as I thought they would have been, especially with all his clout and his name. Like, his name holds weight, but, like, your stats don't show the a rationale as to why your name should hold weight, especially in the field that you're in, the industry you're in, the league that you're in. So, yeah. Draymond's stats aren't as high as you think. He just literally, like, he's a role player, and he just plays good defense. So, among all this suspension controversy, he has accumulated over the last 11 years, has he has accumulated 2,231,780. Now, let me, let me read it again. 2 million, two hundred. $31,780 over the last 11 years in fines, according to Basket News, and just me trying to, like, you know, add it up. Um, because his it was $1.5 million in fines before he punched dog, before he punched dirt. So, yeah, just to put that into perspective. So, since his indefinite suspension announcement, the Warriors are saving – Roughly about $519,055 towards the tax of every game. And Draymond is obviously on the back end um, losing out on that. And then some. Which is insane. Absolutely insane. I Once again, I did try my hardest to like stick up for Draymond. Like, oh, maybe he's going through something. But after I watched that video and after, you know, doing my research and kind of even just like, Paying attention, like paying attention to his stats for one, paying attention to his mannerisms for two, um, and just trying to like understand the guy from like, just overall trying to like understand the guy from like outside, you know, looking in. Um, but I'm like, damn, if his teammates are getting on here like, oh, he needs help, like I hope he gets the help he needs, then I mean, I'm gonna take it for what it is. But after seeing that clip of 138, not 100 of a minute and 38 seconds of him beating up people and assaulting people is crazy. That did it for me. But in better news, um, during the Lakers and the Spurs game, we got a generational matchup, okay? That was a great game. As we know, LeBron, he's a legend. He got the matchup with the recent 19-year-old rookie, Wimby, of uh, Victor Wimbanyama. Um, it's actually a 20-year difference between those two. Um, he's 29, uh, Brown is like 39. He's still playing. But uh, Wimby started in his fourth straight game, which is crazy because I think the Spurs record is like four and like 10 or four and like 12, something like that. Um, but Wimby started in his fourth straight game um, as a forward, not a big. Shout out to Shaq. And shout out to Wimby for proving him wrong. Um, but Wimby is currently leading the rookies in both major defense categories. Rebounds and points. He's really showing to he's showing his ass and he's showing that he's here. He didn't come to play. He didn't come to play, baby. So um Brian, of course, he showed out during the game per usual, but obviously he was no match for the upcoming rookie, Wimby, and the Spurs defense during this game. So I mean it just goes to show that no matter what age you are, as long as you can play D, you can play a role, you can be LeBron. Boom. In other news, Tiffany Hayes is retiring from the WNBA at 34 years old. She said that this is her final season as a guard for the Connecticut Suns. Um, but she does plan on playing overseas. Hayes recently announced on her podcast, Kind of Me Out. Oops. That has, um, and I quote, you can still catch me overseas. I just figured I'd focus on one thing and then summertime I could turn up my business and family and just live like that. Um, so then during her podcast episode, she goes on to express her feelings towards playing two seasons during the WNBA and how she's getting older and how there are so many things she's always wanted to do but hasn't gotten a chance to, you know, just due to her career and her trainings and her just prepping to be in the position that she is in life right now. 
which I feel like is amazing. My whole perspective on her taking the time out to actually become her own person aside from basketball, build her brand, build her business, and finally get the opportunity to be with her family. I love that for her. And that's something I've also learned that self-care is really important. And no matter what opportunities, what job, what school, what city you decide to take a break from or just decide to no longer deal with or entertain yourself with, and you do it out of pure and positive intent, it'll always be there. Like The WNBA will always be there, but family, memories, and special moments won't. So I really commend her for that. And I, I like that she's able to establish those boundaries and still able to be successful overseas. Like, I love that for her. I love that. Shout out to Tiffany Hayes. I wish you the best, babes. Okay, so during my wrap up for sports, um, I'm going to get into Lady Hoops again, just piggybacking off that Tiffany Hayes news. So now, I know I mentioned in the first episode of What's Your Perspective, my top five Lady Hoopers. But after watching South Carolina blow out Presbyterian, I thought I made a top five of my top five Lady Hoop teams this season so far. So, I'm going to start off with my number one, and that's going to be South Carolina. They're currently 9-0. and um, They have accumulated over, well, at this point, over 900 points this season. And some of my favorite players that really stand out to me is Chloe Kitts. Cardoso and now Walker for stepping up as the big man while Cardoso is down. I commend you. You're, you're doing your big one, babes. I love that for you. Um, so next up is my number two is UCLA. They're also 9-0, and they've been able to accumulate 861 points over the course of this season. Um, my favorite players from UCLA are Lauren Betts, a sophomore. Uh, she's a leading scorer on her team, and she's also 6'7". Um, and she's also leading in rebounds, along with Kiki Rice, who is leading in assists. And my number three is going to be Iowa. They're currently 11-1. and one. Um, They've accumulated 754 points this season. And, of course, one of my favorite players on the team, Raiden Supreme, the number one in the mock WNBA draft, is going to be Caitlin Clark. Um, she's dominating and obviously carrying her team. She's a leading scorer on her team with points assists or well, assists and um i don't know if it's rebounds too but yeah and then for my number four is going to be texas um they're currently 10-0 they've accumulated 732 points this season and some of my favorite players on that team is going to be taylor jones she's a leading scorer and ronnie Harmon, she's leading in assists continue balling out y'all been climbing up the ranks this season i'm proud of y'all i love to see it Next up on my list is going to be five, and it's going to be USC. So USC is currently 8-0. They've accumulated 697 points. Um, my favorite players on this team is obviously the big dog, maybe the biggest out of all of these, you know, the rising star, uh, Juju Watkins. Uh, she's the leading scorer and a top player in the league right now, as I mentioned, along with Raya Marshall. Shout out to both of y'all. And I just want to say, continue balling out this season. Um, I hope that all the Lady Hoopers continue to show out and pave the way during their time competing at the college level and Lady Hoops. The thing that I have been thinking about lately is I wonder what the matchups are going to look like for this championship season. LSU aren't as high on the ranks as they were previously last year when they won the championship. And things have kind of like started up a little bit within like the Lady Hoop League and Rome in general, especially with, once again, the talent pool getting so much bigger. So many women that are so, so talented. Um, so, I, yeah, I wonder who's going to be those like top, what, top four teams? I, I want to see the top six for real. But the top 16, well, the top four teams that are um, going to compete to go to the championship. And I also cannot wait to see who's gonna win the championship so that's all i have for music entertainment and sports this week i hope you guys enjoy it thank you so much for stepping in and you know what i just have one question what's your perspective